Open your eyes, people of God, and look around you. Haven't you ever wondered why some individuals seem to be divinely favored while others tread on paths filled with trials? Some appear to have been touched by God's grace, while others seem to be constantly battling against the tide. Aren't we seeing strange things happening? This is a question that has been whispered in the pews, debated in the theological halls, and pondered deep within the recesses of our hearts. Does God choose who is saved? You see, Scripture teaches us in Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love, He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. The words are clear, but the concept can sometimes be elusive. God, in His infinite wisdom, has a plan, and that plan has been set into motion long before we took our first breath. Now, some might say, does this mean that our lives are predetermined and we have no say in our salvation? I want you to pay attention. The beauty of God's grace is that it is freely given. John 3.16 declares, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. The key word here is whoever. It signifies choice, decision, and free will. The truth, dear children of God, lies in the harmony between divine election and human free will. While God, in His sovereignty, knows the end from the beginning, He has also granted us the gift of choice. He beckons, calls, and extends His arms, but it is up to us to take that step, to accept His invitation, to believe and be saved. Let this be a reminder. We are not mere puppets in a grand cosmic play. We are beloved children of a Heavenly Father, endowed with the agency to choose, to seek, and to embrace His everlasting love. Now, I implore you, beloved, stay with me on this journey. By the end of this enlightening voyage, I will offer a prayer that will resonate with today's teachings, a prayer that I hope will anchor your heart and spirit in God's eternal promise. Stay tuned, listen, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Remember, while the questions may be complex, the answers, grounded in Scripture and faith, can illuminate our path and provide us with clarity and hope. Children of the Most High, have you ever stood in a crowd and felt unseen? Remember those days in school during a sports event when teams were being picked? Some were chosen first while others waited, hearts pounding, hoping not to be the last one standing. In our worldly experiences, being chosen often brings joy, but being unchosen can bring heartache. Now, I want you to reflect on this. Isn't our relationship with God somewhat similar? Some feel chosen, blessed, and favored, while others feel overlooked, forgotten, even unchosen. But I want to challenge that notion today. The Scriptures declare in 1 Peter 2-9, through 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Every word there speaks of purpose, of belonging. So, if the Word of God declares that we are chosen, why do some still feel unchosen? The devil wants you to feel left out. He wants you to feel that you are not part of God's plan. But remember, the devil is a liar. For John 15-16 through 16 tells us, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So, why the dichotomy? Why the feelings of being chosen versus unchosen? The key lies in our perception and understanding of God's love. God's love isn't like the love of this world. It doesn't pick favorites based on merit or appearance. His love is unconditional, all-encompassing, and available to every single soul. Yes, there are times when it might feel like God is distant, that He has turned His face away. But that's when faith comes into play. Even when we feel unchosen, we must cling to the truth that God's love is unchanging. When you walk into a room filled with darkness, you don't question the existence of light. You simply turn it on. Similarly, 
When feelings of being unchosen cloud your spirit, turn to the Word, ignite your faith, and let His light shine upon you. People of God, the battle between feeling chosen and unchosen is real. It's a battle of the mind, a battle of the heart. But always remember, in God's eyes, you are chosen, loved, and precious. No worldly experience, no past mistake, no lie from the enemy can ever change that fact. Now let's delve deeper into understanding how this divine choice works in tandem with our free will. Let the Spirit guide you as we journey through the mysteries of predestination and the gift of choice. Ah, the age-old debate. Are our lives meticulously scripted by the divine, or do we hold the pen that writes our destiny? It's a question that philosophers, theologians, and believers like you and me have grappled with for centuries. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Romans 8, 29 through 30. It says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. These words, they're heavy with meaning. They suggest a God who sees all, knows all, and has a plan for all. But does that mean our choices don't matter? On the other side, we have Deuteronomy 30.19 where God says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Choose life. That's an active call to exercise our free will. How do we reconcile these two truths? How do we marry the idea of predestination with the gift of free will? Imagine you're on a grand ship, destined for a specific destination. That's predestination. But on this ship, you have the freedom to move, to interact, to make decisions. You can dance under the stars or stay in your cabin. You can help others on board or keep to yourself. That, dear ones, is free will. The ship has its course, but you have choices to make within that journey. The devil wants you, wants all of us to be confused. He wants us to think that our choices don't matter, that we're merely players on a stage with no control. But that's not the God we serve. Our God is one of order, of purpose, and of love. He has set a path for us, yes, but He has also given us the agency to walk that path with intention and purpose. So what's the takeaway? It's this. While our lives may be influenced by divine planning, the choices we make, to love, to forgive, to serve, these are ours. And these choices, made in tandem with God's plan, can lead to a life of fulfillment, purpose, and eternal joy. As we navigate this journey, remember that God's predestined plan and our free will are not at odds. They're parts of a beautiful dance where God leads and we follow, making choices that align with His will and purpose for our lives. And in this dance, there's grace, there's freedom, and there's boundless love. Let's continue to explore these profound truths as we delve deeper into what it means to be elect in God's eyes. Step into any bustling city center and you'll witness a tapestry of humanity, each person with a unique story, a distinct journey. Among the sea of faces, a question arises, who are the elect and who are the reprobate? This dichotomy, this division between the chosen and the rejected, is one that has sparked countless discussions and debates. When we turn to Scripture, we find in Romans 8.33, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. This verse emphasizes the concept of the elect, those chosen by God. But why are some chosen and others not? And what of the reprobate, those seemingly rejected by God? First, we must understand the heart of God. 2. Peter 3-9 through tells us, the Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This verse underscores God's desire for all to be saved. 
His heart is for every soul, every individual. Yet, we see the term reprobate in scriptures like Romans 1.28. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Here, Reprobate doesn't necessarily mean rejected in the eternal sense, but refers to those who have turned away from God, choosing to follow their own desires. The stark difference between elect and reprobate is not about God's whimsical choice, but about our response to His call. Are we turning our ears, opening our hearts, and responding to His gentle nudges? The devil wants you to believe you have no say, that you're either in or out based on some divine lottery. But that's a distortion of the truth. While God, in His omniscience, knows the choices we'll make, He never forces our hand. The choice to follow, to be among the elect, lies with us. Consider a potter at his wheel. He shapes and molds the clay, but sometimes the clay resists, becoming hard and unyielding. The potter's intention is always for beauty and purpose, but the clay's response determines the outcome. So, children of God, where do you find yourself today? Among the elect, responding to God's call, being molded for His purpose, or resisting, stiffening against the potter's touch? It's a question of the heart, a matter of choice. As we unravel these mysteries, let's remember that the journey of faith is a continuous one. We're called to seek, to knock, to ask. And in that seeking, we find our place in God's grand design. Let's delve deeper into the security of our salvation, understanding the nuances of standing firm in faith and the possibility of drifting away. In the vast expanse of our Christian journey, there lies a crossroads, a point of contemplation that many a believer has wrestled with, the assurance of salvation. If I've given my life to Christ, am I eternally secure? Or is there a chance, a possibility that I might fall away? We live in a world filled with choices. Every day we decide what to wear, what to eat, where to go. But beyond these mundane decisions lies a deeper, more profound choice, the choice to remain steadfast in faith or to drift away. The scriptures offer us insight into this very dichotomy. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. These words seem to paint a picture of finality, a point of no return. But what does it truly mean to fall away? Conversely, we find solace in John 10, 28 through 29, where Jesus proclaims, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Here lies the promise of eternal security, the assurance that once saved, we are always saved. The tension between these two notions can be daunting. But let's consider this. A relationship with Christ is just that. A relationship. Like any relationship, it requires commitment, nurturing, and continuous effort. Imagine a beautiful garden. If tended to, watered, and cared for, it flourishes. But neglect it, and soon weeds take over, choking the life out of vibrant plants. Our faith is much like that garden. The seeds have been sown, salvation granted, but it requires our daily attention. The devil wants you to be complacent. He wants you to believe that a one-time commitment is enough, that you can coast through without nurturing your relationship with the Lord. But be wary, for while our salvation is a gift, maintaining our walk with God is a daily endeavor. People of God, the challenge is real. Every day, we're faced with distractions, temptations, and trials that threaten to pull us away from the Lord. But with every challenge comes an opportunity to grow stronger, to deepen our roots in Christ. So, where do you stand? Secure in the knowledge of eternal salvation or teetering on the edge at risk of falling away? Remember, the Lord is always reaching out, 
always ready to pull you back into His embrace. As we continue on this spiritual exploration, let's delve into the concepts of eternal security and eternal judgment, understanding the balance between God's grace and our responsibility. Journey with me, dear believers, to a place of introspection, a place where the promises of eternal security meet the stark realities of eternal judgment. It's a balance, a dance of divine love and divine justice, and it's crucial we grasp this as we navigate our faith walk. Eternal security. Oh, how comforting it is to hear those words. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8:38 through 39 For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This promise, this assurance is like a warm embrace on a cold night, reminding us of God's unwavering love. Yet, on the other side of this coin, we're faced with passages that speak of judgment, of accountability. Consider Revelation 20.12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. The dead were judged according to what they had done. These verses serve as a sobering reminder that our actions, our choices, have consequences. So, how do we reconcile these two truths? How can we rest in the promise of eternal security while being mindful of eternal judgment? Consider a loving father with his child. This father provides, protects, and promises to always be there. That's eternal security. But the same father, in his love, sets boundaries, rules, and consequences for actions. That's judgment, born out of love and concern for the child's well-being. God's love for us is immeasurable, boundless, but His love is also righteous and just. While He offers the gift of salvation, He also calls us to a life of obedience, of righteousness. The devil wants you to take God's grace for granted. He wants you to believe that because you're saved, you can live carelessly without consequence. But such thinking can lead us astray, away from the path God has set for us. Dear children of God, we must live with an awareness of both these truths. We must embrace the security we have in Christ while also living with reverence, with an understanding of the gravity of our choices. For in doing so, we honor God, we honor His sacrifice, and we align ourselves with His divine purpose. As we delve deeper into the mysteries of our faith, Let's turn our attention to the concepts of limited atonement and universal salvation. Let's seek understanding, clarity, and wisdom as we continue to explore these profound truths. Dive deep into the ocean of theology, and you'll encounter vast and sometimes turbulent waters. Among these waves, there's a debate that has persisted for centuries. The scope of Christ's atonement. Was it limited to only a select few, or does it encompass the entirety of humanity? Let's unpack this, exploring the nuances of limited atonement and universal salvation. Limited atonement, as some theologians propose, suggests that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was exclusively for the elect, those predestined to be saved. They often cite verses like John 10:11, where Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This seems to hint at a specific group, the sheep, for whom Christ sacrificed himself. Yet, as we flip through the pages of Scripture, we find verses that paint a broader, more inclusive picture. Take 1 Timothy 2-4, through which states, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Or even John 3.17, which proclaims, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. These verses seem to champion the idea of universal salvation, the belief that Christ's atonement is available to all. So, where does this leave us, believers seeking to understand the heart of God? I want you to imagine a vast banquet, 
a feast laid out with every delicious morsel you can think of. This banquet is God's gift, His offering. Now, while the invitation to this banquet is extended to all, not everyone chooses to attend. Some may decline the invitation, others may be hesitant, and some may never even open their invite. The feast is there, available to all, but not all partake. God's love, manifested through Christ's sacrifice, is that banquet. It's an invitation to salvation, extended to all. But our free will, our choice, determines our response. The devil wants you to believe that you're not invited, that the banquet isn't for you. But that's a deception, a veil over the truth. Christ's sacrifice is a testament to God's boundless love, a love that desires all to be drawn near. Children of God, our faith is rich with mysteries, with questions that prompt us to seek, to knock, to dive deep into the Word. As we reflect on the magnitude of Christ's atonement, let's approach it with humility, gratitude, and an open heart. And as we journey forward, let's explore the contrast between biblical predestination and popular misconceptions, seeking clarity and truth in God's Word. In the sprawling landscape of Christian doctrine, few topics are as intriguing, as debated, and sometimes as misunderstood as predestination. The world has its notions, its interpretations. But today, let's anchor ourselves in the Word, discerning biblical predestination from popular misconceptions. Biblical predestination is rooted in God's foreknowledge and sovereign plan. Romans 8.29 states, For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Here, predestination isn't arbitrary. It's anchored in God's foreknowledge, His divine insight into all of time and space. Contrast this with popular misconceptions. The world often paints predestination as a fixed, unchangeable fate, where individuals have no say, no choice in their destiny. They picture a puppeteer God, pulling strings without regard for our will or desires. But is this the God of the Bible? Ezekiel 18.23 poses a poignant question. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Sovereign Lord? Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? This reflects a God who desires salvation for all, a God who respects our agency and free will. The devil wants you to feel trapped, ensnared in a predetermined fate without hope. But the truth, the biblical truth, is far more liberating. While God, in His infinite wisdom, knows the end from the beginning, He has also granted us the gift of choice. Predestination, in its biblical context, is not about fixed outcomes, but about God's overarching plan working in tandem with our free will. Consider a master artist painting a vast canvas. He knows the final picture, the end design, yet each brushstroke, Every hue and shade is influenced by individual choices and decisions. God is that master artist, and we, with our choices, contribute to His grand masterpiece. Children of God, as we navigate these profound truths, let's be wary of misconceptions that might cloud our understanding. Let's cling to the Word, seeking wisdom and clarity from the Scriptures. Our faith journey is filled with discoveries, with moments of revelation. Let's continue this exploration, delving deeper into the essence of trust and understanding God's divine plan for our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, we come before you today, humbled by the vastness of your love and the intricacies of your divine plan. We've sought understanding, delved deep into the mysteries of predestination, free will, and your boundless grace. As we've journeyed through these truths, Lord, let our hearts be anchored in your promises and our spirits be aligned with your will. God of all wisdom, clear away the misconceptions, the doubts, and the fears that might cloud our understanding. Illuminate our path with your word, 
serving as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Let us not be swayed by worldly notions, but stand firm in the truths revealed in your scriptures. We pray for those who feel lost, those grappling with questions of purpose, destiny, and salvation. Reach out, O Lord, with your comforting hand, reassuring them of your love and the hope they have in Christ Jesus. Father, as we reflect on the teachings and lessons we've explored, let them not just be words, but seeds planted in our hearts, bearing fruits of faith, love, and unwavering trust in you. Finally, Lord, as we face each day, help us to remember that while we may not comprehend the full scope of your plan, we can always trust in your goodness, your justice, and your unchanging love. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. If you feel that this video or any of our other videos can help someone in their faith journey, don't hesitate to share it with your friends and family. Word of mouth really helps our community grow, and the bigger our community, the more love and light we can spread in the world. If you haven't yet, please consider subscribing to our channel and turning on notifications. That way, you'll never miss out on the fresh content we upload regularly. From Bible studies to reflections and prayers, we strive to bring you content that nourishes your soul. Now, if you have any prayer requests, we invite you to leave them in the comments section below. Your needs are important, and we'd love to include them in our prayers. And remember, even if we don't get to respond to each and every request, rest assured that God sees your needs and hears your prayers. You are never alone on this journey. Thank you once again for being part of our loving and faithful community. Until next time, may God bless you all.